Ho, 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 and welcome back to another episode of Rangers Rando. The Rangers are going on a heater in their last nine games. They're 8-1, and one, which includes, since we've last talked, the Toronto game where we goalied them again. It seems like it happens every year. Uh, the Philly game, which is the Tony D'Angelo trip, Keandre Miller highlight reel goal game. The Chicago game, where it's the Truba revenge game against Anthony CU. And then the Pittsburgh loss. I would have honestly rather lost to Toronto. They're like top of the league, more top of the league than Pittsburgh is. Pittsburgh was going on a tear there for a little while, but losing to Pittsburgh like that, too, it's, uh, it's terrible. They just, the lapse of judgment for a period really bit them in the butt. And then to cap it all off, an Islanders win that looked a little shaky there for a little bit, right? Didn't hold the lead f- until the third period, but came away with the win going into the break. We don't play till Tuesday, so get a little time to rest rejuvenate. Hopefully nothing changes with the Lions. The Lions are finally looking where we want them to. Hey, got one. Come on. Why not? Just keep it there, Gallant. Happy holidays, everybody. Let's get into the episode. starting to see the Rangers are sliding in and it's kind of solidifying their spot here. I think it was Ryan Callahan was talking about this. The bottom teams you're going to start seeing fall off and you're going to start seeing the top teams really establish themselves in the place in the standings that they're going to end up. What I've been liking is the Devils have been losing at an amazing pace. I think Carolina has overtaken them as number one in the Metro and the Rangers are kind of hovering up and down between the third place in the Metro and the top wildcard spot. But the Caps have come back into the picture, which is crazy because they're really hurt. That's kind of what the the picture looks like in the Metro right now. It's the Rangers and the Penguins mucking it up for the wildcard in the third spot. The Caps and the Islanders just below them fighting for that last wildcard spot. And then you have the Flyers and... Blue Jackets, who are just totally out of the race. Like, they're almost guaranteed not to get a playoff spot. And I'm fine with Carolina taking that top spot and it being a battle. But to, to see the Devils be top of the league and then go on, like, a seven- or eight-game losing streak and just, oh, just slowly but surely fall out of favor, that is delicious. And I think it ties back to their goaltending because not much else has changed. Maybe Vitek Vanacek isn't the answer. Maybe Mackenzie Blackwood... Needs to come back and choke again. I don't know. It's great. Enough about the Devils. The Rangers are tied for seventh. I think they're tied with two or three teams that may have a game or so in hand. So they're look. it looks like they're in ninth place. But realistically, points-wise, I think it's 43 points. We're tied for seventh in the league. Which, by the way, top ten teams in the league, seven of them are from the East. It's just, it's not even fair. That Chicago game, by the way, Truba scores his second goal in two games. And the best part of that was... Truba chirping after his goal, looking directly at Anthony Sioux, and the camera caught it perfectly. He mouthed, do you want the puck? Hey, hey, do you want the puck? Oh my gosh. Can you, what a good, like, timely chirp. That's what, that's what it's all about. Like, on the ice, kind of quick-witted chirps. Don't go after a guy after the game. Like, he hit you hard, and you're complaining about it. Like, sweet dude, you never got hit before? Come on, chirp on the ice. It's fun. It's funny. Truba did it, and it was, it was like, the funniest thing I, that I've seen in a while from him. Back to that Islanders game. Big divisional rivalry matchup. The Rangers were trailing the whole game. Capo Caco gives away to Matt Barzal, who he's been having a slow goal year. He has a ton of assists, but not that many goals. And Caco gives him just a prime breakaway chance to score on Eeyore. Really tough scene. Everyone was clowning Caco on Twitter. And I hate that. I've been a Capo Caco Revenge or Redemption Tour member since his first terrible year on the Rangers. I just think it really speaks to the Rangers how Kreider and Goodrow and maybe some others went over to him after that giveaway goal, talked to him, kind of brought him down, got him level-headed, and said, hey, things like this happen. You're a good player. You belong here. And I Thankfully, Gallant didn't do anything to like sit him because people were calling for him to be benched the rest of the game after that. It's like, you're going to make a mistake. Everyone, the best players make mistakes. And then they learn from it and they capitalize and they build on it to not do that again and then redeem themselves. And finally, Capo Caco redemption tour in full effect. He gets the go-ahead goal from a sweet dish by Keandre Miller in front of the net. Top shelf back bar. Oh, does that hurt? 
oh, Islanders fans, does that hurt? I think it might. And the Rangers can hopefully carry this momentum. They get four days off. They can be rested. They come back on Tuesday against the Capitals. And let's just let's just ride this into the new year. How about it? All right. That's a lot of just the games and what has been happening and the ups and downs. It's been a lot of ups recently, which has been great. But I reached out to some of my followers, some of my friends, just to ask, get a little mailbag episode in, get some questions out there that you wanted to be answered. So I'm going to answer that next. And we're going to talk about trade targets, NHL scheduling, which includes NHL rivals, and then the lines. The Gallant finally, he knows the perfect lineup. He did it. He finally did it. All right, let's go. So first I want to talk about the scheduling. Just for the league as a whole, right? There's 82 games. You play everyone in your division three times and everyone else twice, I think. The league has been talking about putting in an 84 game schedule so that you can get more matchups in conference than you currently have right now, which I like. I think adding more games is a little crazy. 82, I know like basketball does 82, baseball does like hundreds, right? 160 something, but 82 is a lot. And especially on these players. And then when they go into the playoffs and they're completely battling, and it's not like they're not battling in the regular season. To add to this 82 game schedule, I think is a little excessive. I've had some people say they want to remove games from the schedule, which I don't want to do because selfishly, I don't want hockey taken away from me like that. But adding just seems unfair to the players. And I don't know if the players or the CBA that the players have with the NHLPA would allow that to happen. But we'll see. The point of that though is, like I said, to get more matchups and more rivalries on the schedule that are within conference. That leads into my first mailbag question. Who are the New York Rangers rivals and why is the NHL so bad at managing these rivalries? Ties into they seem to think that every team should play every other team. Let me ask you this. Just think about this. The Rangers playing the Coyotes twice. What does that do for either team? It's the it's one of the last teams in the league in the in the Arizona Coyotes and it's the Rangers go having to travel all the way over to Arizona to play them twice. To me it's like doesn't really make sense. It's cool that you have these, you know, interchanging teams that will always see each other and you're guaranteed to see every arena and every city, but it doesn't really do anything for the storyline, the storytelling and like the the road to the cup, right? Or the cup finals and the only time you're going to meet one of those western teams is in the final because that's how the playoffs are set up. You're always going to stay on your conference until the last game. So I think we should really be deprioritizing playing cross-conference with this current playoff structure. And wouldn't you rather play more times in division, in conference, get those rivalries like really heated instead of having to, you know, drag a New York team to Seattle or Arizona or, you know, Southern California where they're playing the Ducks and it's like, okay, yeah, we lost to the Ducks. I get it. I get it. But that doesn't do anything for either team except points. And I feel like sports is an entertainment business, right? You want to build these storylines and these rivalries. They should prioritize more in division and more in conference games. And if it's at the cost of out of conference games, so be it. I don't really see a problem with that. It happens in football, right? There's a 17 game season now. You don't play every team once. You miss teams sometimes. And then sometimes the teams are on the schedule. I think scheduling should and needs to get better for these storylines to grow. That brings me to my next point, which is actually answering the question that was asked. Who are the Rangers rivals? And it's very simple to start at least. It's in division, right? It's anyone in the Metro because that's who you're battling with for the most part for playoffs and then for the most part in playoffs, at least the first round. Within that, I kind of look at it like who has been relevant while the Rangers have been relevant. So when the Rangers are in the playoffs, who do you see the Rangers playing the most? And in my career as a fan, they've played the Penguins and the Capitals the most. I feel like, I think actually the Rangers and the Islanders have, haven't have crossed paths in the playoffs in, in years, like over 10 years. That's why to me, the Islanders are just, I mean, they've been relevant, right? Like the last, when they made the conference final back to back, the Rangers weren't in the playoffs. That's that's why it's like hard for me to be as motivated against the Islanders. The thing is Islanders fans hate Rangers fans and vice versa. So I think that just because of the uh, the proximity to each other, and same with the Devils. The Devils have been terrible forever, but now that they're good and you have to hear from all these stupid Devils fans, that makes the rivalry grow and grow and grow. And 
Imagine, we can, we only get to play three times. That We've played the Islanders three times this year. We don't see them again until maybe in the playoffs. Isn't that kind of messed up? I think it is. What I would say, I've kind of been jumping on the Ovechkin bandwagon because I want to see the great eight break the great goal record. But remember in the 2010s when the Rangers would meet the Capitals every year in the playoffs? That's the rivalry. And then now it's still even, even still Pittsburgh. That last Pittsburgh game felt like so much hatred and blood boiling, storytelling, storyline challenge that to me, the top rival for the Rangers are the Penguins. It's got to be just because of the relevancy. I think Caps used to follow, but now that they're kind of lower in the league and I'm not sure if we would see them necessarily in the playoffs, that makes them less of a rival. Islanders and Devils, if they stay relevant as long as we think the Rangers can stay relevant in their window, I think that will that rivalry will grow and grow and grow. And then you look at like Carolina. For some reason, maybe I think it has to do with the proximity. Carolina and Columbus, they're just kind of further away. And yeah, they're kind of a, they're a division rival, but they're, they're really not. Like, I don't have that same passion against them as I do these other teams. And then the Flyers, like, they're a dumpster fire. I love that. I think as a New York, the New York to Philly rivalry in general for all sports is huge. So if the Flyers were putting up good, a good team in the playoffs, I would, I would probably feel a little bit differently. Right now, since they're irrelevant and they're a dumpster fire, not a rival. So I think how it goes right now, current day, Penguins, Devils, because they're top of the league, Isles and Caps are here, and then like Carolina and Columbus. It's a little bit subjective, but that's how I see it. The next question about trades, the trade deadline. Who are the Rangers going to be targeting at the trade deadline? Obviously, you've heard names like Kane. You might have heard Tarasenko. You might have heard Bo Horvat. I think if it's any of those, it's going to be Kane just because he has said that he loved playing with Artemi Panarin. He said that it was the best line mate he's ever had. He saw him on the ice in ways that no other player had seen him. It's going to take a lot to move it around, right? We are projected to have 7 million or so cap space at the trade deadline, and we would need Chicago to eat some of the salary. What that also does is it's really only a rental unless Kane is going to take less to play for us. We can't afford to pay him after this year. So if they're just trying to be aggressive for this year, then maybe it makes sense. But you have to understand that we probably will have to let him walk, especially if we want to keep the younger guys on our team. And then you have like the guys like Tarasenko and Horvat. They don't make as much as Kane, but again, you, you're not sure. Tarasenko has been injured countless times. You really want to pay and pursue a guy long term that has that type of injury where you're gonna end up paying him a lot and lock someone in like that where again it's just gonna price out your kids horvat has i think five million or so of a cap hit which could be more of a reasonable guy to go after but i think vancouver is gonna want a lot vancouver essentially said everyone but elias Pettersson is on the table so i would not be surprised if the rangers were trying to get someone from there be it Bo Horvat or Brock Besser even. Besser has been scratched a couple times. He's young. I think he's 24, 25. He's a right winger. What that says, though, is, you know, are we done with Kraftsov? Are we done with Kako? We're going to have to sign these guys. And are we just going to ship them off? Our young, really young, right wing draft picks. I'm not sure. And then it's the matter of addressing the defense. Harper has been playing well these last few games, but I don't think he's the answer. And, and Hayek also was kind of playing okay, but he's probably not the answer either. They don't have trust in Jones right now. I think they maybe want to see how him and Robertson compete in the AHL and then see if they can call one of them up next year. But they should go after at least a rental defenseman to play on the bottom pair with, be it Truba or Schneider. I like Schneider up in the top two pair. He's been playing great. He actually was producing at a good pace. And Miller's now picking it up product-wise. I just think you need someone a little bit more solid. Maybe a little better than Braun, if you can. You remember, we brought Justin Braun in last year um, to play on that bottom line with Schneider. And it was fine. It worked out. They weren't glaringly bad. And I think you can find someone like that as a pure rental on deadline day. Something I've been hearing, though, going around is Vladislav Gavrikov from Columbus Blue Jackets. He, he I think, is... He is he's under 30 i think he's 27 and he's russian and he doesn't have the best like expected stats right now but he's on one of the worst teams in the league so if you put him in a system on a team that he doesn't have to be the two-way guy he can just like produce a little bit but like focus a lot on defense as well i think you'll see his numbers will start to jump and he's fairly cheap i think he's controlled at like three or four million a year that's someone you i could see them extending long term and then seeing 
how, you know, everything shakes out with Lindgren's contract coming up next year, Robertson moving up, Schneider maybe moving up in the lineup. I would expect someone like Gavrikov or a defenseman signing to be a higher priority. And then just kind of seeing where Kane shakes out. Kane, it's, it's in Kane's hands, right? He can tell Chicago where he wants to go. And they'll call up the Rangers and say, hey, this is what we want. This is what we want to do. And then we'll have to make a decision. Can we get rid of Hayek? If we do, does that also get rid of Kravtsov and like a first round pick for Kane for one year? Is that worth it? I don't think so. I'd rather develop and build and have multiple years of the Rangers in the playoffs and being contenders. Not sell it every year, sell it every year, and then you have no prospects and then you're, we're back to rebuilding. That would suck. And if in the process we lose our kids, that would really suck. But I expect similar moves to last year. Drury has been good at deadline and off-season acquisitions getting guys who fill a need. Like they thought Trocek would fill a need for Strom, which by the way, I think he totally has, even if he's on the third line. They're going to bring in guys like Vetrano and Kopp who shoot and are established wingers. And I think it might come at the cost of Kraftsov and Sammy Blay, but that's okay. We just need to, if we can make our lineup deeper, we should absolutely do it. I think D, number one, we get a sixth defenseman who's established and can provide some offense and we can trust. And then we'll go after guys like Vetrano or Kopp who can just fit in anywhere. And if the Kane deal is there and if it makes sense, that will happen. The other guys, Tarasenko, Horvat, Besser, I'm not really sure. I, I feel like that's kind of, it might be too much for the Rangers to do, but that's my take on it. All right. This is a little bonus question. Which ranger has the best lettuce, the best letty, the best lechuga? You know, I don't see Zibanejad as having lettuce. He just has straight, long, beautiful hair, right? And then it's like, all right, you take him out of the equation, then who is it? It's Panarin. It's got to be Panarin. He has like the, the poof coming out here. I'm kind of actually modeling my own hair after him. Trying to get it, I have to really like fluff it up though, you know? It's Panarin. Panarin has the best lettuce. There's no like real other lettuce on the team. If I'm wrong, prove me wrong. I think the kids have to start growing out their hair. That's what I think. Because if one of them could definitely pull it off. I'm giving that one to Panarin. All right, wrapping up, let's just go over the lines because I really like how they've kind of developed. And, you know, Gallant said that he knows what the perfect lines are. It's kind of like, okay, great. You know what the perfect lines are. Play them. Why aren't you playing them? It doesn't make sense. So how the last few games have started is... Panarin with Zibanejad and Goodrow. And Goodrow has been fine, and he has been playing well on any line that he's slotted into. That's like a real leader, real good, hard-nosed player that we need, and I like to have, especially come playoff time. Second line of the kids, I love it. They are getting more time to gel because they are playing together on 5-on-5, five five, and they're producing on 5-on-5. Five five. Kako has nine goals. That is more 5-on-5 five five goals than Leon Dreisaitl and Patrice Bergeron. Isn't that a little crazy and he's a bust right yeah he's a bust okay sure sure so that's the top two lines the third line which it took too long to get here so it's a little frustrating but i'm i'm so glad we did Heedle deserved to be pushed up Kreider honestly deserved to be pushed down and you're not going to take him off the power play once it doesn't matter Kreider, trocek vz vz has also been great but having him be good and great on the third line is amazing. It just shows how deep you can be. So that's happening there. And they are meshing. And I think Kreider and Trocek are really feeling each other. Like they know that each, like what each other's strengths are. Trocek has some nasty hands and a good shot. And Kreider's just the speed demon. And then VZ just picks up the picks up the leftovers. It's great. It's a really fun third line. It's kind of making me feel like uh, that Broussard third line that we had in the 2014 run. I think it was Broussard and Zuccarello. That was, it's it's good. It's like not bad guys and like very high skilled guys and they end up producing together. It's great. And then you have the fourth line, which was Sammy Blay, who took a stupid penalty. He's very frustrated. He doesn't have a goal in like 33 games, 35 games. He made a stupid penalty that cost us a goal, ended up being a major factor in the loss. And so he gets benched for Gautier, finally. I don't know why Gautier came out of the lineup. It doesn't make any sense. But he's in, and he plays great, and he has a goal and assist. He's the first star of the game because he's just a meat wagon. He's, he's fast, and him playing with Brodzinski, who's also fast, and Kravtsov originally. Originally, right? That's how it was. And Crafts Up was proving every night still should have never, again, questionable call by Gallant. And I think maybe Drury or Dolan or whoever, the call came down to Gallant and said, hey, you know how your job is on the hot seat? Put Crafts Up in, play him. And Gallant's like, sure, I'll play him. Fourth line with, you know, 
two guys who don't really produce. And then watch, it won't work. And guess what? It kind of worked and he kind of produced. He kind of played better and he got this confidence about it that allowed him and allowed Gallant to say, okay, we need some offensive firepower. Kraftsov, first line with Panarin and Zibanejad. Why they didn't start him like that, I don't know. Maybe just get his legs under him, whatever. But now he's on the top line and they move Goodrow down to the fourth and the fourth line is now just producing like the whole, you're getting production from every line, which is just, it's finally coming together. These are the perfect lines we've been talking about. This is it. And if we can just stay this course, you know, I don't expect us to keep winning eight out of every nine games we play. But if we can just keep this lineup as it is and keep hammering teams and keep playing teams that are good and beating them or at least putting up a healthy fight and getting points, we're going to be a team to be reckoned with at the trade deadline that is fairly established in a high spot and in a playoff spot. And then we can just focus on getting better, just improving instead of there's a gaping hole that we need to fill. That's the ideal. And that could lead to a deep cup run. Whew. All right, I talked for way longer than I wanted to. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. Happy holidays. Let's go, Rangers. Please like, comment, subscribe. We'll see you in a couple weeks.